I guess even though we're waiting on a bunch of people to join us, so we had quite a few registered. Uh, I guess we should probably go ahead and get started because we got a Let's lot to cover today. Roll. We do. And we we have, have a lot to cover. And we're talking about time management today. So we should be good stewards. We should today. be on time. We should yeah. be on time. Maybe so. <laughs> Otherwise, we're not managing our time or theirs very well. Or Exactly. Exactly. So uh, as per always, we love the chats. So keep those chats coming. Um, Carol and I are uh, able to, to juggle lots of things. Uh, she's coming to you from her closet today, and I'm coming <laughs> to you from, from my hidden underground bunker uh, and my hashtag 2020 summer cabin is what we're calling it. So we're in an Airbnb while our new home is being built. So, um, so yeah, so my background is definitely a little bit different here today. So, Kevin, do I give a thumbs up on, on the new background with the, uh, the bling hard hat? So I haven't heard from he him. He says he loves it. He loves, he loves it. it. Oh, good, good. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. All right. So Ms. Morgan, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, hello, everyone. I am Carol Morgan coming to you from the greater metro Atlanta area where I am founder and president of Denim Marketing. Um, and if you think of it as marketing, we probably do it, but we actually focus mostly on content and on things that drive results that we can measure and um, report and measure again and be as effective as possible. So that's a little bit about me. So, and I am Kimberly Mackey. I'm, oh, I, I apparently I'm majoring in the, uh, in the <laughs> I went a little, got a little excited. Um, uh, my company is New Home Solutions Consulting and I am most of the time a sales management consultant. I work in the area of sales and marketing management um, I work as oftentimes an outsourced sales manager for builders. A lot of builders who are, have uh, maybe they're making a management change or they are trying to grow to the point where they need a sales manager. Um, and a lot of what we're going to be talking about today are skills that I have learned from doing that role. So I like to say that uh, I, I am the person who helps sales to be the engine that drives the train rather than running it off the track. So uh, that's me, and that's how to contact both of us. Uh, of course, we're here to help you guys in any way, and uh, just you know, reach out to us. And um, we are recording today, so you will get uh, a link to it. You can always find it on newhomesolutions.com forward slash blog. Uh, that will take you to any of these webinars. So um, if you uh, if you are so inclined to go there, or you want to share it with someone, so. Today, we're definitely talking about stop majoring in the minors. How many of you have heard that expression, right? And, uh, and we're not talking about baseball today. So uh, we're talking about focusing on what matters. And I'm, I, I'm gonna confess something to you guys. I am not an organized person by nature. I am a salesperson. So I do have a little bit of that squirrel, squirrel, you know, bright, shiny, bright, shiny objects. Uh, syndrome. I all I have to work at being organized, and it's something that every day I have to get up and refocus myself on. And I have created some tools that have helped me to be successful. And oftentimes, one of the biggest compliments I get is, "Oh, well, if you want something done, give it to Kimberly, because we know it'll get done." And you know, sometimes that's a blessing, and sometimes that's a curse. But it, it is it is nice to know that you know if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person, right? Because they ha we have to we have to figure it out. We have to figure out how to do that. So I do ju juggle a lot of balls. I know Carol does too. So on top of all of the work that she does, and then running thistle down, and how many animals are we up to? Something like you know forty five or fifty. I have not counted how many animals are there. Isn't that bad? There are eight cats here, which greatly inflates the equation. <laughs> so, but yes, between birds and are, are we counting bats and bees? Now? I do not. The bees are, well, the bees that were not where they were supposed to be are gone. The honeybees, I have no idea how many thousands of those there are. So yes, we're up in the thousands if you want to count those. And the bats, <laughs> even my bat guy told me this week, he's like, I hate bats. <laughs> Because the bats moved out of the house, into the barn. Most of them left, but they're not in my house anymore, but they appear to be on top of the columns on the front porch. There's just a like little it there. space they can squeeze in. So they now we have to convince them to leave that space. 
I'm ready for them to fly south to Mexico. So bye-bye bats. So see, you think you guys have distractions. <laughs> so so I, I've moved once this year and I'm moving again. And, you know, we're living at the barn and we haven't had air conditioning for three days. So that was really distracting. So that happens. Life happens, guys. And it's okay that it happens. We just have to have a plan to keep us on track so that we can get everything done that we need to get done. And maybe not some of the things that we don't need to get done too, because sometimes that's important. Uh, in fact, a lot of what we do, we probably don't even need to do it. Um, so it's very interesting. So we're going to talk about focusing on what matters. Wow, this chat is awfully quiet. I know we, and, and I, uh, we don't have as many people as we normally do, but you guys got to chat it up. Let's hear about it. Um, let's talk about being in reaction mode versus pro action mode. And yes, I know I'm misspelling these words this way, but I did it on purpose. <laughs> so, um, somebody's going to go, ah, you're tight. You, you've got a typo in there. No, I don't. I have, it's that, it's that way on purpose. So I deal with salespeople a lot in, in my role. And one of the challenges of being in on-site sales and even builder management, sales management, is the phone rings and we react. Somebody walks in and we react. Everything we do is a reaction. Well, I couldn't handle that as an on-site person. And so I had to deal with, create some coping mechanisms to get control. And one of the things that I did was to figure out times when nobody's going to bother me and block those times. When I was in on-site sales, uh, I worked in a community where we literally would have thousands every week. It was, it was a problem because we had way too many people coming in. It was very unique. It was trendy. People were just curious. They wanted to come by and see what was happening. Well, too much traffic can be just as bad as, as not enough traffic. And so it was a good problem to have, but I couldn't get anything done. So I couldn't get my reports done. I couldn't get my contracts written. You know, there were lots of things that I needed to do. So I would sneak in sometimes on early morning and especially on Sunday morning when we didn't open until noon and I would take the coffee pot upstairs because otherwise I was sitting in a fishbowl and I would park down the street and like in an alleyway so that people couldn't see my car and didn't realize I was there. And that was my time. You know, that was the time that I, I blocked out. Well, later, as I went into sales management, I realized that as the models open at 10 a.m., that's when the salespeople come in and that's when the problems and that's when they need me and stuff is going to happen. And that's when meetings were happening and the division president was going to be calling and marketing needed something and HR needed this. And, you know, you were being pulled in four million different directions. So and many of you can probably relate. You're going, uh huh. Yep. Sounds like my day. Well, absolutely, but you've got to get into pro-action mode, and a lot of times that is a, taking that step back and figuring out when can I work uninterrupted, because uninterrupted work is going to be about 10 times more productive, maybe even more than that, than interrupted work, and you turn the phone off, and you set a timer, and you go against that timer, and I know I'm much better at, up against a deadline. So I'll set timers, fake timers for myself. I have a program called Maven Link where I actually uh, time myself for my clients and I'll do that. I'll turn that timer on. So I know that I'm, I've got to get a job done. I've got to get it done in this amount of time and I only allot that amount of time for it. And it's amazing how often I can actually accomplish that. So, but yeah, ditch the, the sticky notes. Carol, what do you think about all these sticky notes? And I know that pizza was inspiring today. I think I'm glad that they can't see my desk. So, <laughs> um, I do tend to have one giant to-do list and I'll block off time on my calendar, but I am also queen of sticky notes and little pieces of paper that have things on them that I need to come back to at some point. Not necessarily to-dos, but little notes all over the place. Yeah, I, I really got rid of most of my sticky notes, so I don't even, like, I have some, some notes, um, but I keep a, a notepad, uh, and that's like my journal, and I always keep that going, but I've, I've really done, that was one of those things, I had to give up the whole sticky note thing, because then I lose the sticky note, and then I'm going, oh, I, know, I wrote that phone number down somewhere, so yeah, I had to kind of give all of that stuff up, so anybody relating to any of this so far? 
they're so quiet. It makes me nervous. When Kevin's quiet too, that's even that's scarier. <laughs> He's trying desperately to get the sticky notes off of his desk. <laughs> Oh, focus plus intensity equals results. I don't know what I just did, but I somehow managed to make the chat too big. So 20% um, of your activities equals 80% of your results. You've all done this, right? We know the 80-20 rule. The question becomes, what are you doing with 80% of your time? Are you tracking it so you know how badly your time is kind of getting out of control and kind of getting hijacked? Last week, my week got hijacked by a new client that I'm onboarding. They had a challenge and it was one of those weird off the wall challenges that comes along maybe, you know, once every five years. So I was so glad that I was there to help them through it, but it ate up two days of my time. And those were two days that I blocked out to do something else. So now, you know, I had to figure all of that stuff out because that was still very important. You have to be flexible, but you also need to prioritize. And figure out if those, what are those 20% of things that are equaling 80% of your results? Right. And if you don't know, then you're just going, you're giving everything the same priority. And everything isn't the same priority. Carol, you have anything? I think I'm just sitting here thinking if 80% of our time, we don't really know what we're doing or that's that kind of fluff that's out there, then we should certainly have time for the emergencies that come along because we're probably not being very effective anyway. And a lot of times we aren't, I know there's many times you, you go home and I feel like this, I feel like this lady, boy, I can so relate to her. <laughs> I feel like this a lot. And, you know, I think probably most people on here do. You've got a million people asking you for a million things and it feels like they all want it right now. So, you know, one of the things you can do, and I try to teach my staff to do this because they feel like if I ask them for something that it's a fire or I want it right now. And I have told them, you know, you need to come back to me and say, when do you want this? How important is it? I'm working on these five other things. Help me prioritize. That is the key right there. My friend Leah Turner um, that uh, with Melinda Brody and company says this all the time. No is a complete sentence. You know, <laughs> and that's hard. That's hard for fixers like us who want to fix everything, right? So asking somebody, taking a step back, you're not really saying no to somebody, especially if it's your boss or, or, or one of your clients, but you're ha having them to you know, help you to prioritize. I think that's really important. Now, as, a, as an onsite salesperson, your clients or your customers are all gonna think their emergency is the only emergency for you. So you may need to do that proactive ex uh, expectation setting with them. To, to say, hey, guys, every day is going to be, you know, you're going to have questions. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. You know, if you just tell them what's happening during the week and what to expect, a lot of times you can stop some of those questions uh, because they're just not informed. You know, in, in building my own house, we, we did our pre-drywall this week. Well, there was no freak out. My, um, the, the builders actually laughed because I, one of my, a couple of my lights were not aligned, right? Because the electrician got happy fixing three of them and then forgot that, oh, wait, those visually line, need to line up with these others. I'm like, hey, you know, could you just slide that one over a little bit? No big deal. And he goes, do you know how much I appreciate that you said no big deal? And then once he's, and he sent me a picture back and goes, it's done. And I was like, I just love alignment, don't you? And he's laughing, you know, because it was no big deal because I knew what to expect. If all of your buyers know what to expect, then you don't get all sideways and you don't have to always put out these fires. So one of the things I say, the easiest way to stop putting out fires is uh, stop starting them. It's kind of a novel concept, but yeah, but no, I can totally relate, especially last week. I was a bit on the overload thing. The challenge is not to manage time, but to manage ourselves. This is a Stephen Covey. I talk about the seven habits of highly effective people in a lot of my training that I do with, especially with salespeople and sales managers. And it's so true um, because we all have the same amount of time in the day, right? But Except for Helmut. Helmut's on this call and I swear the man doesn't sleep. So he has more hours than we have because he doesn't need to sleep. But Helmut is like a superhero. So yeah, I think he does some sort of time warp thing. Yeah, for sure. But, uh, but and we'll see if he's actually paying attention. Oh, he's laughing. Yeah. <laughs> so 
the key though is is figure out what the what those things are figure out the return on investment of each activity so as an outsourced sales manager i'm often hired three to six hours a week sometimes to do a job that would typically be a 40 to 60 hour a week job depending on the size of the company i'm expected to deliver the same results that that 50 or 60 hour a week person would deliver but obviously i can't do that in five or six hours so what goes away everything except the most important things that deliver the results. It's the only way it works because if I don't deliver results, well, nobody's going to pay me. So, you know, that, that's not going to work. So that, but that's all I can do and, and still stick to the budget that my client has. So Carol, I know you probably have people hire you again for the same, for certain amount of time, right? It's absolutely true, but yeah, it's true in life as well as business or, you know, in, when you're not working, you know, figuring out what's the most important to you and prioritizing that, whether that's family or exercise or getting outside, you know, if you don't prioritize it and you don't you know, plan it and manage it, somebody else will manage it for you. Yes, they will. Yes, they absolutely will. So that's really the trick. And, you know, a lot of life is, you know, it just happens if you let it. Um, but you, you know, you've got to slow it down. You've got to take the time and sometimes you have to slow down to speed up. So before the day ends, plan what the next day is going to be and what the priorities for that day are going to be. And then look at each one of those priorities and not only just the list, right? That never ending list that always keeps growing, but what are you going to get out of it? Or what is the result of that going to be? And if the result isn't much, then maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Maybe it doesn't even need to be done. That's a tough one because we, you know, oh, well, it made the to-do list. It must be important, right? So sometimes it isn't. Fourth generation time management is about focusing on the results, not focusing on filling the time. You know, and, and I'm telling the millennials have this, right? They don't live to work. So we Xers and some of us boom, some boomers that are, that are on here too, right? It was all about, hey, I got to punch the clock. I need to be productive. I need to be working during this whole time or I'm going to be, I'm going to be seen as someone who's slacking off. Well, as the gig economy has, has risen, uh, one of the things that the gig economy is, is, I, don't, I just need to get done what needs to be done. What is the priority so that then I can go on and do these other things that are important to me. So, and, and it may be that work, more work is important to you. Maybe you're just trying to figure out how to get more work done in less time. Okay, well, this works too. So figure out, again, what are the most important things? Prioritize those figure out when to do them and block them, chunk them together with your time blocks. And it is amazing how fast that happens. And then, and then this happens, Carol. Yeah. Every this, day. Every single day. And I would guess this happens to everyone on this call, but everybody here gets 150 emails a day. So then the question is, is your email managing you or are you managing your email? Um, I actually have a couple of friends that manage, you know, inbox zero by the end of every day is their goal. I'm not that good, but I do really, really try hard to touch it once. So touch it, respond to it, save it, um, you know, maybe file it if you file your emails, but, you know, handle it as it comes in and don't let it run your day. And I think we're all guilty of that, especially those of us in the marketing seat. You know, somebody responds to you and you feel like, oh gosh, I've got to handle that email now, even though maybe you were in the middle of another project. So setting blocks of, of time aside to check your email so that you're not always checking your email and just managing your email versus managing the tasks you need to manage. Uh, I think this is something that's really hard for those of us who get a lot of email. This was the hardest thing for me. And I, I now make it a point. I do check. I look at my email on my phone in the morning when I'm having my coffee. Oh, but <clears throat> excuse me sorry i think the water went down the wrong pipe um but after that i don't check my email until about 10 
<coughs> and the whole point is then I'm not on somebody else's schedule because as soon as I get in there, I'm on somebody else's time. And uh, Helmet, Helmet just called me on the carpet. I do have an email from you, Helmet. I'll answer it when we get off of this. And actually, yes, I have not been responding uh, that much to email. Yesterday, I was focused on booking Atlanta Real Estate Forum Radio, which is my podcast guest for next week, because I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, this is next week. So that was my priority yesterday, that and then a big client call that we're developing this really cool series of infographics for. So... Yes, and today my focus so far today has been getting um, a, a few slides added to Kimberly's deck of slides. So I, I owe Helmet an apology. Poor Helmet, he's not a priority. <laughs> That's just wrong. <laughs> Got to work on that. So the key is if you plan ahead, then your life won't plan you. It won't run you. And this is what most of us look like. We start planning, but we just don't quite make it. And then our, you know, plan ahead just runs right off the page. And we run out of space or time. We run out of space and time. Absolutely. So uh, that is the key, it, it, honestly. And I know everybody was looking for some secret answer here and, and some, some trick. This is it. I'm sorry. <laughs> you got to plan this stuff ahead. One of the ways that I plan ahead is I do use time blocking. And this is something that I train and I train my salespeople and particularly my sales managers to do is to time block. And time blocking very quickly is chunks of time that are similar events. So you know that each week you've got certain things that you have to do. Um, so plug those in first. You know, you, there's certain meetings that happen every single week. There's this, you know. Also plan in some what the fluff time. So my friend, uh, my friend Noli always, that's how she responds whenever I shock her with anything. And I'm like, oh, I love that. So, you know, stuff happens, plan some time for that. I worked with a coach um, who was helping me and he told me very, or he goes, your Achilles heel is you are too much of an optimist about what can actually happen during the day. And he goes, this is gonna kill you if you do not plan in some life happens time uh, because you're, everything will be like a domino effect. So group things together. And then if you are, for instance, if you're a salesperson and you're on floor time, it's floor time because that's the priority, right? The first thing you want to do is be able to handle any traffic that comes, walk in traffic that comes through the door. But during that time, we know that walk in traffic doesn't always come through the door. So during that time, what are things that you can work on that it won't really matter if you get interrupted doing them. I mean, some things you really need to 100% focus on and other things you can pick up and drop off and pick up and drop off. So what are those things? And you can put those in your block. So it's floor time is the main block, but your to-do list fills in what you're gonna do during that time. Um, if you're going to make prospecting calls, then your to-do list becomes who you're gonna call during that time. If you're gonna reach out to realtors, if you are a sales manager, you're, you may block out time to do your planned encounters with your salespeople, whether you're going to do those face-to-face -face or you're going to do them over Zoom, you're, then you block that out and then your to-do list is the specific per salesperson you're going to get with and what you're going to cover, uh, hopefully using your planned encounter forms and, and or your CRM so that that is all already automated for you. But I like time blocks. I like colorful time blocks because they're pretty. So, and then I do them on an Excel spreadsheet. And then I kind of superimpose that onto my calendar. And a little trick that I've learned is if I take my time block and I make it a text box, instead of filling it into the actual cells, then I can quickly click and drag and move as sometimes my weeks move around. And I don't have to retype or worry about recoloring. I just like grab it and slide it. Uh, and, and move it around within that same time frame. And I do have a template for that. If anybody wants it, feel free to email me and, uh, and reach out to me. I'll be happy to send you a blank template and, uh, and, and talk to you about that. So, um, but time blocking will make a difference because when you're doing similar projects at, at the same time, you get faster at doing them and you'll find you can do them in a, far, in a lot less time. Carol, you've probably felt this way. I know I have. Absolutely. Meeting to death. Yes. Or so, zoomed to death at this point. Who feels zoomed to death? 
So, and uh, for those of us who do a lot of association work too, occasionally. <laughs> committed to death, yes. Committed to death, yes, exactly. So every organization has meetings, right? And some meetings are really, really important. Other meetings, you feel like this, you're just banging your head against the wall. And honestly, sometimes I think that some people just feel like they need to schedule meetings to make themselves feel important. What meetings are really important in your organization? That is the key. So look at that and look at what meetings are the most important. Look at what meetings might be able to be combined. And also look at the content of those meetings. If, you're, if the content of those meetings is to review emails, then you've got a problem. If it's something that could be covered in an email and then a follow-up just to hold people accountable for it, or maybe it could be a video email if it's a training meeting and you know it's 10 minutes of tutorial and then you send that out and then you just hold people accountable. There are lots of things that you can do so that you don't have to have as many meetings. Now, sometimes it's important to have that face-to-face -face interaction, but think about it and think about those regular meetings and how much of those are time wasters and how much of them would be better spent even with a one-on-one -on -one? or maybe having the people pop in. Let's say it's your pipeline meeting. So you're looking at every project under construction, your, your whips, your work and in, in process, right? Maybe just the people who are touching this particular project are on the call and then they pop off and then the people on the next project, they can pop on so that you're not sitting there wasting everybody's time to hear what's going on on everybody else's project if it isn't relevant. And if there are broader themes that come up, well then share those with the group in an email as a follow-up. So, or maybe share them at the beginning of the meeting when you have everybody on, but you don't need to keep everybody on all the time because when they're in those meetings, they're not being productive, that's for sure. Delegate. So, and I promised as part of the description for this email that I would talk about this, even if you don't have people to delegate to, there are ways to delegate. What actions, what acts need to happen? That has to, you have to set that first. What are the important things that have to get done? If you look at the people in your organization, maybe it's not even their title, but you look at people's gifts because sometimes people have a job and then they have these other gifts over here. So who's good at doing what within your organization? And we do this through the association all the time, right? Through committee work, we're, who, who's good at this and who's good at that? And you know, we're all kind of on the same playing field, but then whoever is good at that particular skill is the one who steps up and takes over for that particular job. You can do that within your company as well. So salespeople, you probably don't have an assistant, but you probably have people on your team if you pull, pulled your resources, who are good at this or that or the other. Sales managers, you might not have an admin, you might not have a marketing um, a coordinator person. So, but you probably have some salespeople who are good at that sort of thing. Look at the skill sets, come up with a strategy for how that person can take on this extra role. And in return, you can do something else for them. So you team up. What can be automated? A lot of our CRMs, a lot of our software, some of these things can be automated and don't really have to be touched again, but they still have to be managed. You just have to look at them and make sure that you're getting that right information and still hold people accountable for putting good information in because garbage in, garbage out. So, and again, examine those, those team strengths. Question the activity is there a return on the investment for doing the activity? Because if there's no return on it, you know, when I'm working five or six hours for a company, a lot of that stuff just goes away. Nobody does it. Sometimes we assign to this person or that person, um, those other tasks, but a lot of times it just stops happening. And you know what? We still get the results. So the bottom line, who is right for the job? And is it a job that really needs to be done? Because it might not be. And then is it a job that you can delegate and outsource? I would say most of our clients are perfectly capable of doing, you know, the majority of the work that we do for them, but they've chosen to delegate it because there's just way too much on their plate, way too much on their plate. 
Oh, absolutely. Sometimes it just makes so much more sense to, to do that. Yeah. Then train your team. Um, this is one of my hot buttons. So a lot of times I'll hear from my staff, oh yeah, I just did that myself because it was faster. And you know, we're all, you know, we're all guilty. I'll raise my hand. I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes it's faster to edit something than it is to point out to the person the mistakes they're making, or it's faster just to do whatever it is because you've done it before. The problem is, is that six months down the line, you still have this employee that doesn't know how to do this one thing because you've always finished it for them or done it for them. So, you know, one of the rules we've had, and it's a little harder during COVID with all of us you know, working from home and not, not everybody's together to train people, but we have found that we can train over Zoom and go to meeting and over the phone using screen shares um, for most of what we do. So, you know, make sure that one of your goals is rather than always just fixing it and finishing it for somebody or doing it because you've always done it to train your team and, and, you know, move those tasks to them that they should be doing. And that is, it's hard, you know, it, it, it's something you have to step back and you go, am I going to be do, and is this a task that's going to have to happen over and over and over again? So I know yeah. that's hard for me. My, my um, admin, my right hand, right hand person, my, she's an account manager. And, and, and a lot of times she anticipates, fortunately, she reads my mind. So that's always helpful. Um, but sometimes it's hard for me to stop that, stop and think, is this something I'm going to have to keep touching over and over again? Maybe that's better for her to do um, rather than me doing it and take that time, like you said, to train her because she's very focused on one side of my business but to bring her in, and I've been training her a lot more on the other side of my business too, and I, it's been a real help uh, and certainly has freed up a lot of my time to be able to be more of a resource to my clients. So, yeah, it, you know, and again, if you don't have that kind of resource, either look at outsourcing or look um, in your own team and find out who, who might have those skill sets that you could train them to do that. This is yeah. a good one, Carol. I like this one. So this is where focus is really the key. Um, you know, marketing with intent versus random acts of marketing. You know, have a plan and a strategy for everything you do. You know, our clients who are the most successful um, are the best at planning and the best at reporting. So, you know, when we report to them every month, we go through it in detail. We figure out what's working and what's not working. And obviously, if it's not working, we try to fix it. If it is working, we want to do more of it. Um, but this doesn't happen by chance. Um, you know, having that plan and really working that plan and understanding your strategy, maybe even breaking it down per community. One of my absolutely favorite clients about every two weeks sends us the most detailed report in the world as it relates to marketing and her individual communities. She'll list the community and every single tactic she's using to get the word out on that community. Now, it's great for all of us who are marketing for her because I think she's working with at least three different agencies. So we're able to look at that and ask questions and go back and forth and know everything that everyone's going on and the whole big picture without having to sit in on a meeting and learn all of it because there's a lot on there that you know doesn't really apply to me but some of it does and sometimes I get my best ideas for what else we can do for her from that document that she sends out every other week. The other thing I would say here is you know beware of shiny objects. Uh, we all get distracted by whatever is new, whatever that new bling is, but put a plan in place and work that plan. And if something new comes out, then look at what the new thing is, research it, figure out how you're going to use it and work it into your budget, you know, down the line. It doesn't mean you have to drop everything you're doing now, you know, get distracted and completely change course. Um, staying the course is what's going to really help you uh, be most effective with marketing. Well, and you won't know if you don't give it enough time for it to be effective. You know, exactly. you see people just, oh, I did it once and it didn't work. Well, that's not really how it, how it all works. Yep. <clears throat> You're right. Stick to itness. Stick to it. -ness. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And then content. We write an awful lot of content at Denim Marketing. And the thing I hear from lots of people, you know, 
is either they don't know what to write about, which that would be a whole separate webinar. We're not diving in that today, but that there's just so much demand for content that they feel like they're always writing social or always writing a blog or writing a new press release or an email marketing piece or a newsletter or new ad copy or whatever it is. Again, if you go back to looking at all of that as kind of one big picture, you know, what's that entire universe of content that you have to write and that you have to share? And then for each of those story ideas, what's the best and highest use of it? So maybe the best and highest use of, you know, your new community opening when it comes to content is obviously you want it on your website, but the copy that you write for your website can be slightly tweaked to become your news release. They can then be slightly tweaked to become your blog post. Well, your blog post, you're going to share on your social media. So you've just made light work of that. Then, you know, when your email marketing piece goes out, you can pull a few nuggets from, you know, all the things you've already written. So, you know, you start to look at it as, you know, one piece of content that's used in many ways instead of individual silos that you have to fill up. So, yes, your social media is important. And, yes, your news release is important. And all of this content is important. But look at all the stories you have to tell on a monthly basis, which is what goes back to that last slide and having that marketing plan and really having a plan and working it. You know, figure out what your stories are in August, September, and October and how you want to tell them and where. And then use the content in as many ways possible. I think that advice uh, is not only just for your, for your content and your social, but all, everything you're touching. Mm -hmm. I mean, what else could it be used for? I mean, really think about it in a bigger picture kind of, kind of way, because, you know, I, I know just recently I couldn't find one of my templates that I built and it, I, the content itself is super easy, right? But the, the template allowed me to, to have this training template for somebody uh, so that I'll, all I have to do is just plug in for, for the client specifics. And I, and, and the fact that I somehow left it on a, uh, on one of my external drives that ended up in storage, just, I was ready to shoot myself for oh, it. So always brutal. think about how can I apply this elsewhere? So you're not always reinventing the wheel, right? You know, right. when you're, when you're always reinventing the wheel, it takes a lot of time, effort, and energy. Absolutely. So you just hit, you, you helped Helman out here. He likes something. He's ding, 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 ding. Yeah. That's what he needs to do. <laughs> Good. Glad that we're able to help you, Helmut. And this is just one of the little, you know, little kind of tricks we use. This, um, you know, this is created in Microsoft Word. You can create a calendar. Um, so we'll create a calendar for each month of content and then add, you know, what are the events? And those could be events going on in the world, you know, holidays, or they could be your events. Maybe you have a model grand opening on one week or um, you're announcing a new product or a new service. So plug all of that into your calendar. And then we write 30 days worth of blog post. So you get 30 days worth of blog post all at once. Again, you're working your plan, not scrambling at the last moment, wondering what you're going to post on Facebook that day. You've already Already written all of your content. If you're using a um, social media tool like Falcon IO or Agora Pulse or you know Hootsuite or any of those different methods that you can use to post it, on a lot of them you can go ahead and schedule them all. And then the things that happen, like you've got this fantastic agent who's willing to take a picture of the home buyer that just wrote the contract standing beside the sign, then you're going to have that content to fill in with. And either, either the sales agents can post some of that content, depending on your corporate culture, or they can send it to you or to your, you know, your marketing um, team to post it. Uh, and I know that's something that Kimberly works on too a lot with agents is getting them involved in some of this social media to do the heavy lifting. Because again, when you look at back at our delegate slide, the person you may be delegating to might be within your organization, but not in your department. And that's so true. And this is something, this is a tool that I use. I love when I'm working with Denim or, or, or an agency and they, I can see their calendar and then I can have the on-site team and the sales management team and even the construction team uh, get involved and get out there to make the photos and make it more personal because you have to realize your agency is not there with boots on the ground. So while they can provide all this great content for you and they can do stuff that, that creates more search engine marketing and the, you've got to be the one to fill in with the personal stuff that people are really going to relate to and are going to share the, the expression that your company, the, 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 the image of your company, the, the spirit of your company so that takes boots on the ground and I like to get everybody involved in that and I'll share these 
kinds of calendars and do them as a, as a Google Drive document or a, uh, a OneDrive, depending on, you know, what my builder uses. Um, but I like to, to, uh, to, get my, to get the sales team and to get those people who are out in the field, get them involved in it. And sometimes you have to give them ideas and you have to remind them and, well, occasionally a cattle prod, but, you know, you, you get there. So, um, so Melissa's asking me the time blocking template. Um, I would absolutely uh, love to share that with you again, Melissa. So I know you had that at one point and I will definitely send that back to you. That's one of those things. I know I'm guilty too. I'll have my time blocks all set up and uh, then uh, life happens and I move or I get two new clients and all of a sudden now I find myself two, week, two or three weeks go down the road and I realize, wait a minute, I'm not working my time blocks anymore. I have to go back and reset that up. So, and Carol's asking some good questions there about technology for people. So, uh, streamlining your sales and your sales management process, you know, again, focus on that return on investment. And if you don't know what the return on investment is for an activity, you probably don't need to be doing it. That's really the key. And, and, and as sales managers, I know you get pulled in 4 million different directions. I mean, that is that we, we're in crisis mode. We just operate in crisis mode all the time. But if you stay the course and you say, I'm going to be in the field and I'm going to be in the field on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, or I'm going to be in the field on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Fridays to make sure that you can hit with your sales team. And I encourage you to mix it up a little bit, maybe not be exactly at the same time. But what happens when you start to do that on a regular basis, first of all, sales happen in the field. So that's where you need to be. Uh, one of my favorite bosses of all time told me, get out and stay out. And after I got over being offended by that, I realized she was really helping me. So as a sales manager, take your laptop, take your stuff with you and get out in the field. But your sales team will get to the point where they go, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I need your help with blah, blah, blah. Block that time off. And when they know that you're going to do that and you're going to do that on a regular basis, then your phone doesn't ring and they don't get in crisis mode. Plus they get to see what you're doing and how you're doing it. So the next time a similar situation comes up, they just handle it. So you're handling less of it because you're leading by example. So anybody who's in, in the leadership role, I strongly encourage you to do that. Um, if you're in division leadership, the same principle works. So with your teams, block that time that you're going to have that those planned encounters with whoever your team is and go over those important metrics with them and and those those meetings can get really even condensed down till they're not huge drawn out long events because they happen on a regular basis <clears throat> so think about that return on investment again i sometimes work maybe five or six hours a week for a company at most the maximum i give is, is like 10 or 11 hours a week and sometimes that carries the load for the sales, uh, for what their sales process has to be all the way through and includes writing, you know, policies and procedures and uh, reviewing and, and setting up CRMs and all of those things that, that we all have to get involved in. But the most important thing is to keep the sales going while we're doing it. So anybody, how many of you, I see a few of you that I do recognize as, as sales leaders uh, in, the, in your organization. How many of you are in sales management? So Kelly Joe's in here. I see you. Anybody else? Claudette, I don't know how you do everything you do. Claudette's another one of those people like Helmut. She's always got 5 million things going on. So time blocking. Yes. Yep. I, I believe it, Claudette. So, and she's amazing. She's one of those people that, that I think she's, she must say yes to everything. Oh, Marianne. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. As, and as a, uh, an area sales manager, Marianne, you're probably getting pulled in a million directions because you are out in the field and you are one-on-one -on -one, and yet the office is always calling. The office needs this and the office needs that. And where's this and where's that? Uh, so you get very much into that reaction mode for sure. So avoid administrivia. I, I, this, is a, this is a Kimberlyism. Um, I, it's just something that I've always said that stuff that doesn't need to get done. Um, I don't know what it is about a sales management role, but it's like, oh, we'll just give it, give it to the sales manager. They'll take care of it. So no, 
look at it and say, is this worthy of your time? And what is that return going to be? And if there is no return on it, then maybe it goes away. But also look at who in your organization might be better off handling something like that. And maybe it's because of where they're physically located. So, so for Mary Ann, she's out in the field. If somebody's asking her to come in and run off a bunch of reports on the computer, well, that's, now she's got to drive back to the office that could be an hour, hour and a half away, right? And that, so there's the, the windshield time that she's losing. And then she's, then she's in the office, she gets sucked in, and now all of a sudden the rest of the day is gone. So you've totally lost her for the day. Whereas if you have someone, an admin or someone else, maybe she could just send it to, and they can do whatever needs to be done. She can talk to them while she's driving, if she can safely do that. Uh, or when she's out in the field, think of the strategy beyond beyond just hey, I need Mary Ann to do this, or I need I need the, the I need this person or that person to do it, and really think of who's the best person to do it. Um, and you will find that administrivia goes away a lot on, on that. Mary Ann, can you relate to any of that? I bet you probably can. So the lot a lot of windshield time, especially when your communities are really spread out, for sure. And Neil is is. I-75 is closed, you know, for crazy stuff, like, every day. I don't know what it is about that. So, um, what's Helmut saying here? It's hard to stay focused on, oh, when you're on the road. I asked, yes. Yeah, I had asked the question, you know, what do you do when you have all that windshield time, books on tape or make phone calls? So, apparently, Helmut has to stay focused on the road. Uh, yeah, do set, yes, please. That's your number one priority when you're driving. Remember where it's all about setting those priorities. Um, yeah, I do a lot of, uh, of, of books. So I do, um, I do Audible. And that's my time to put good stuff in uh, when I can do that. I know when I was, a, but when I was in sales management, that was not always the case that I could do that. Um, airplane time, I'm not doing that anymore. But Airplane time was also my time to put good stuff in because if I don't put good stuff in, then I don't get good stuff out. Questions. Let's talk about this. What challenges are you guys facing out there? What are you seeing? What do you, what can we help you with? Yeah. How has, how has COVID impacted, you know, your ability to get things done? I mean, and this is something Kimberly and I have talked about a lot when, when everything first happened in March, it was literally like drinking through a fire hose. I think for most people in sales and marketing for about the first four or five weeks, and then it kind of, you know, settled down. And then as things have changed and we've come out of shelter in place, you know, orders and, um, you know, had to restructure how we're going to meet with people is a little bit more, you know, busy again, but how has that impacted you guys? I mean, are you busy right now? Not busy right now? What are you seeing out there? Do, 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 <laughs> do, 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 do. They might not like our singing, so maybe they'll res respond. Maybe, maybe, yes, exactly. So uh, busier yeah, Claudette than ever. says busier than ever. Yeah, yeah, and Claudette's and in mortgages now, so ah, yes, yeah, yes. you no doubt you're, you know, and the thing about mortgages, if you don't like them, wait five minutes and they'll change. So all the rules, everything, you can't know what you need to know in mortgages. It's impossible. Yeah, I'll tell you, Marianne makes a great point. They lost the ability to bring the team together, so keeping communication flowing, and, and you know that's a challenge. So I have a small staff, which is a blessing. But there's, you know, five or six of us, depending on whether we have an intern or not, or, you know, how many part-time people we have. And we're used to all, you know, shouting across the closet, shouting through the closet back and forth you know, in the office to one another. Um, and what we found is we kind of, we use a, an instant messenger so that we're all still in touch, but we actually found that we had to kind of scold ourselves for oversharing on instant messenger because we were being so interruptive. But at the same time, you want to communicate so that things aren't lost in the shuffle. And so we came up with, you know, kind of the internal rule that you can share whatever you want at, during the lunch hour, which, you know, whether you're eating your lunch there or not, noon to one is still fair game. And you can share things late in the day or very early in the day. But the biggest blocks of time in the day, if you have a question, you should try to direct it to just the person who should answer it, not the entire team. And to really just focus, 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 focus. But for me, I found I have to really process the information I have and make sure that I know how it affects all members of my team. Because 
we all work on different different aspects of different projects and it might be that you know we learned something that affected our um, radio show podcast and this actually happened I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out a way to share it but I knew something that affected that and I made the change there but I forgot to tell my account manager who manages that account that she needed to also change it in her notes and related to something she was doing. And that's the thing that I found is the hardest. You know, if we'd all been in the office, everybody would have heard us scramble. Oh, we need to fix this on, you know, we got to fix this on the radio show before it goes live. So we would have known we needed to fix it everywhere. Um, and I thought I had fixed it everywhere initially. And then I realized, oh no, the client also shared it. So just little stuff like that, that, you know, when you're, when you're in a team environment, you share, you know, being so decentralized, I think has affected all of us. You know, is that something you're having to work with a lot, Kimberly, when you're training and working with your clients? Well, I, you know, I have, it's interesting. I always say I have two kinds of clients. I have the clients who copy you on every single email and then those who don't copy you on anything and you find yourself scrambling, right? So, so sometimes I've had the oversharers who do copy me on absolutely everything and they copy everybody. So then it's kind of that death by email. Uh, but so I have to have the ability to filter that out. But, but I do find too, then trying to uh, put the puzzle pieces together without physically being there occasionally I'm very good at putting together jigsaw puzzles, but yeah. Um, Helmet says shifting to total digital interaction with clients. Yeah, and, and Helmet, I mean, I, I, I have never seen anybody go to more association meetings. There was always a picture on Facebook of somewhere, in, you know, within like five or six states he was covering. So uh, I'm sure, yeah, staying put has, for, for many of us has been a bit of a challenge. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I actually hosted the associates meeting this week where we talked about that and we talked, how do you, how do you network and how do you stay in front of people and, and not have it be disruptive, but still keep those connections and we have to work harder at it. So you definitely do. Um, so Marianne, have you guys come up with ways to keep your, the communications flowing or to, or to make the interaction fun with your team? Uh, I think that's part of it too. I think you have to add a little fun. We get so focused sometimes on, on what we're working on that makes it really hard. Yeah, that's, that's one thing we've gone to with our team meetings and I try to do them every other week. It's usually like a Thursday at four. Um, and I'll go through whatever my agenda is with the team because I do try to have focused meetings. So we're usually done in 20 or 30 minutes, but then I just let them talk to each other about, you know, what do they see? How's their family? How's the dog? What are they cooking? Whatever it is, it's their hot button. You know, the stuff that used to happen on, you know, on breaks here in the office because we're not in the office anymore. So we don't get to chit chat as much as we used to. And we certainly don't get to see each other every day. Um, although I will say that's one of the things that's changed the most for us is my staff would come into the office, you know, kind of dressed down some days with no makeup on. Cause back in the day when you went on go to meeting or you had a call, people really weren't expecting to see you. So now I've had to say to them, all right, clients now expect to see you. Even if we are on go to meeting or zoom, you now have to be dressed and ready to go to work. So that's been an interesting change too. I don't know if any of you guys have been impacted with by that. Certainly not the sales managers or out on the road driving between communities, but there's probably some other people on the call that have been impacted like that too. Yeah. So, and uh, just having that time to allow for the chit chat, I think that's important because think about it. If you, you were physically going to a meeting as people are arriving there, that would happen naturally. Mm -hmm. So you do have to allow for that. Uh, virtual, Marianne said virtual meetings, they had an Olympic athlete do a motivational oh, segment. Cool. Ooh, that is cool. Yeah, that's really, especially right now, because you just feel so much for these Olympic athletes that have trained their entire lives only to have their event canceled this year. And, you know, are they, and, and the timing of when you're supposed to peak on that and, and the psychological aspects of it. Wow. So I bet yeah. that was very cool. Yeah. I guess we've all had our events canceled this year. You know, I had a staff member who was supposed to get married in Colorado when all this started and all the flights were getting canceled. And, you know, she ended up replanning her wedding a couple of times and then just getting married, you know, locally with 10 people in attendance. So, you know, we've, we've, we've all changed all sorts of things. And I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to change the way we operate. And, you know, the questions I get now are, do you think, you know, do you think your staff will ever come back to work? And, you know, the reality is they may not want to, but hopefully they'll at least come back into the office a few days a week. Um, and I don't know if you guys are seeing that, you know, people have worked so effectively virtually. Do they really need to come back into the office? 
and can we do some sort of hybrid with people there yeah. and and still having people remotely? I worked um, with a with a large international company a couple of years ago, and you know th they were very good at a lot of virtual meetings. Everything we did was was video chat, but you would have we would be in a conference room with maybe twenty people, and we would be on you know on live video chat with other conference rooms around the country so that everybody could come together. So we were kind of ahead of their time uh, for that. But the, you know, a lot of the meetings were held that way to keep, because there's no reason to do that kind of travel every single week, regardless. But right, right. Yeah. So we want to invite you guys to join us on September 11th at 2 p.m. And one of the projects Carol has been working on with um, um, Melinda Brody and Company, and also Blue Gypsy Inc. I think too, right? Yep. Uh, yep. Is the is the online home buyer mystery shopper report. And so that's going to be one of the things that we unveil on September 11th. It's going to be ready by then. And, and who knows, uh, much more. Plus, you know, if, you, if there are things that you guys are seeing out there, reach out to us and let us know. And maybe we'll incorporate that in, in as well. Um, we're just trying to be a resource for all of you. Yeah. This mystery shop's going to be really interesting, though. You know, it was um, pretty much completed, you know, right around and during COVID. And I think it's going to, you know, I, I guess it probably follows along some of the other mystery shops you all have seen. It's always stunning to me when you start looking at how quickly are emails responded to and are they even responded to? And then did somebody actually pick up the phone to call that lead? So, um, you guys might want to be present. So, we'll have some really interesting stats there. Wait, did you just say pick up the phone? Yes, it's an amazing what? thing. Do you remember the phone? <laughs> ah, yes. I actually yes. have one right here in my office. See, pick up. So you can't see it. Wait, there it is. There it is. Pick up the phone. My closet's in the way in here, so I'm holding a phone, and you can't even tell. I you just can't look crazy. See it? It becomes like a green screen. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So, all right. So we, uh, this is us. This is how to get a hold of us. And thank you all for joining us today. And, you know, again, feel free to reach out to us. Let us know what else we can do to help you. Stay safe out there, everybody. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. <laughs>